Well, good evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and apologize now if uh, the reception is a bit bad or anything. Um, I'm, I'm for, I decided to uh, do the live tonight from my backyard. And so um, I hope that, that it's a good reception. If it's, if it's not, if the, the reception is not good, well, um, it was a good experiment while it lasted. Um, but I hope that you have had a wonderful day today. Um, I know that I really enjoyed this morning's worship service. Um, that has been two months in the making, I guess you could say. And um, I, I really enjoyed it. For those of you that were able to come, I believe we estimated we had about 75 people there this morning. And for those of you that were able to be there, I hope that, um, I do hope you enjoyed it, but I hope primarily though that it um, aided you in your worship of our great God and and um, got you ready kind of got you set and motivated uh, for your worship of God this week uh, wherever you're at whatever you're doing this week uh, it's also been a beautiful day and it's one reason why I chose to do this out here today is because it is an absolutely beautiful day and just being out in God's good creation and um, and so I hope that, uh, that, uh, that you've had the opportunity to enjoy today. And I'm also excited about our time together tonight. And I know that God will uh, do great things as we are seeking to worship Him and to honor Him uh, during this time. So uh, I don't have a whole lot of announcements other than uh, just to remind you Wednesday night, uh, we right now are planning on doing uh, our Zoom Bible study. If uh, uh, myself, and, myself and our deacons will be discussing this week about future plans, and as soon as we have some things uh, that are fairly certain, we will get that information out to you. So be paying attention to the church Facebook page. Uh, be listening out for uh, a phone tree, and uh, we'll be putting out any information. If there's anything changes about uh, the location or how we do our Wednesday night Bible study, Sunday morning and Sunday evening worship, uh, we will make sure to communicate that with you. So um, I hope that, that, um, that you'll be uh, looking for that. So as we um, begin our time together tonight, I want to begin it with, with a song. And um, this is one, it's a familiar song. Uh, if you were listening, I guess it was about a month ago now uh, on a Sunday night. Um, it's a song that reminds us of what we've, of what we've traded in, in light of what God has given us. Uh, through Jesus Christ, we have salvation, and, and He takes all of our pain, He takes all of our, all of our problems, all of our shame, all of our sorrow, all of those things. He takes that from us and gives us joy and peace and grace and mercy and salvation. And so uh, the title of this song is Trading My Sorrows. So if you know it, I hope you'll sing along. Persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond this curse, for His promise will endure. His joy is gonna be my strength. Though sorrow may last for the night, His 
joy comes in the morning and drink my sorrows and drink my shame I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord I'm drink my sickness I'm drink this time we are going to prepare to go to our great God in prayer and uh, we have many things to thank God for uh, thanking God once again as I shared earlier for this beautiful day our wonderful time of worship this morning and uh, thanking God that uh, it looks like things are trending towards uh, things opening up a little bit more here in the state of North Carolina um, as well as across our country praying that, um, that this virus will go away uh, you know, um, God uses doctors and nurses, and I believe he gives them tremendous amounts of skill and, and knowledge. But God can, uh, if for whatever reason we can't, we can't read the mind of God, God's thoughts are above our thoughts, his ways are above our ways. But God can, if he so chooses, come down and eradicate this virus all, you know, all as it is right now. But uh, regardless of what happens, uh, I'm thankful that God is moving, that God is in control, and that, that none of this surprises God, and that none of this is more powerful than our God. Uh, I'm thankful for a good worship service this morning. I'm thankful for all that were able to be out there, and uh, thankful for those of you that, that uh, watched it online. And um, I'm thankful for our church and for faithful people seeking to serve God uh, imperfectly, but still seeking to serve God. Um, I am thankful for all the people that we know of that have recovered from various sicknesses. Uh, those we've had, we have had many in our church that have had babies recently. And I'm just thankful for, for God's movement there. And i uh, thankful for this, this ability. I, I was thinking the other day, I'm very grateful that God has called me to do what I love to do. I love to study God's Word. I love to proclaim God's Word. I love to teach God's Word. And I'm thankful that God allows me to do that. And that's, that, that's just amazing to me. And so I'm thankful for that. And I hope that if you find yourself in the center of God's Word, well, I'm not saying everything's going to be great. I'm not saying every time that, that I'm not saying that, that, that pastoring is the easiest thing in the world and that, and that at all the times it's just a bed of roses. But... Um, I know it's what God wants me to do. And if you find yourself in that situation, then you can thank God too. Um, as we get ready to go to God in prayer, there were many shared during our worship service this morning. Um, I meant to grab those uh, prayer requests as we were leaving, as I was leaving the church today. But there are many people. Um, there was one in particular that was shared with me of an individual that, uh, that uh, took his life this week and praying for his family. Um, there's... Uh, uh, another individual that uh, was shared with me, it's a, a, young, a, younger, a younger girl that um, is dealing with quite a bit of physical issues. Uh, so praying for her and for her family and for the doctors to have knowledge to know what's going on. And um, I know that uh, 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 Caddy also sent me a request uh, this morning in uh, messages. So I know there are many um, I know just praying for our current situation, praying for uh, guidance and wisdom for our elected leaders on the national level, state level, local level, um, and also praying for our country, for our state, and for our region, uh, praying for revival, praying for unity, 
um, and just praying that, uh, that um, we'll see an end to this uh, virus, as has been mentioned. So uh, let's go to God in prayer and uh, ask that, or well, praise God first. Thank Him for all that He's done. Thank Him for who He is. And then ask that God will hear these prayers and ask Him that He'll also be with us in our time together as we uh, dig into God's Word. So let's pray. Almighty God, we thank You that You love us. We thank You that You are with us, that You never leave us, that You never forsake us. You are always here. Wherever we are, You are. And God, we can't comprehend that because I may be in my backyard, somebody else may be in their living room, somebody else may be in their, in their place of residence in a completely different part of the state. But God, regardless of where we are, where your children are, there you are. You're not limited by time and by space. You're not limited by, by the power limitations that we are. We can't do everything. But there's nothing more powerful than you. And God, we're limited in what we know. Even the smartest person in this entire world pales in comparison to being as wise and as knowledgeable as you are. So God, we praise you. We thank you for all that you are. You are worthy of praise. You are the King of Kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Almighty God. God, we thank you that you know everything about us, the good and the not so good. And we reflect upon all the ways that, that we fail you, God. We know it hurts you and it hurts us because we don't want to fail you. We don't want to do things that will dishonor your name. So God, we confess those sins to you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness and that you provide the Holy Spirit within us to help us to, to overcome those, those sins in our lives. God, thank you for that. God, we thank you for everything that you have done. The small things, the big things, the things that we have shared with everyone as well as the things that we have battled with on the inside. You know every situation and you have moved in every situation. And whether we realize it or not, we thank you for those answered prayers. For the times where, we, where you have said yes, where our will has lined up with your will, we thank you, God. For the times that you have said no, where, when you have told us that is not my will, that is not what I want to do, that is not the direction I want you to go in. God, we thank you for that because you are God and you know all. But God, those moments where you've told us to wait, where you've told us to be still and to trust you. We thank you for those as well because they build us. They build our faith. They strengthen our confidence. And they do build our patience in, in our trust of you. God, we come before you. We bring every need that we have. God, there's nothing going on in our lives that you don't know about. There's nothing going on in our lives that you don't care about. And there's nothing going on in our lives that you're not willing to move in. But your word tells us to ask and it will be given, to seek and we will find, to knock and the door will be open. So that's what we are doing during this time of prayer. We are asking you to move. We are seeking your will and we are seeking your presence and we are knocking on the door so that you will open, you will come in and you will do what only you can do in the situations, in our lives, in our hearts and in our minds, God. We ask that you'll do that during this time together. God, that you will come in and that you will help us to hear your word, to apply your word, so that your word can challenge us, can encourage us, and can change us, God. And God, I pray if there's anyone listening, God, that does not know you, that today will be the day that they will hear the gospel proclaimed, they will repent and believe, and they will become one of your children. God, this time... This prayer, ourselves, we offer to you, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, to, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. I know on, on Sunday evenings we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. But tonight we're going to start a three-part series in the Gospel of Luke. 
So we'll be in Luke chapter 15 in just a moment. Uh, Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 32. And this is going to be our text for the next three Sunday nights that we have service. Uh, is going to be Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And so um, I hope that you'll, I hope you'll really pay attention. It's very familiar, and oftentimes when we read something that's familiar, we just skim right by it, and we, you know, we don't let it impact us the way it should. And so, and so I want us to, I want us to really pay attention to what this specific passage of Scripture has to say. So I hope you've had the time now to turn to Luke chapter 15, and, and it's a bit of a lengthy passage of Scripture, so I do hope you have your Bible in front of you, and follow along with me. Luke 15, 11 through 32. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his, he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, or against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years have I served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. May God add his blessings to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. So this is what we know of as the story of the prodigal son or the parable of the prodigal son. And as I mentioned, it's a fairly familiar parable. Now, this is a parable that Jesus tells in a series of parables in response to the fact that he was spending time with sinners. And, and here comes the, the religious elite. And the religious elite look at Jesus and they say, how dare you? You should be spending time with us. We're the chosen ones. We're the ones that God has called out. We are something special. We're the righteous ones. We've been following the law. Why are you spending your time with those wretched, 
tax collectors, with those wretched sinners. And so Jesus tells them a total of four parables, excuse me, three parables here. First, he tells the parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one. The 99 are already safe. It's the one that he had to go find. And the scripture tells us that he threw a party when he found the one. The second one is the parable of the lost coin, where this widow is looking desperately to find that lost coin. And when she finds it, the one of ten that she finds it, she celebrates because she found she found that lost one. And Jesus continues with this story of salvation, this story of God's kingdom, this story of God's of God searching and seeking out the lost with a powerful parable. And so, I don't want us to miss the significant meanings in this parable simply because it is familiar to us. Over these next three weeks, counting today, I want us to look at the actions of the three main characters in this parable. And what they teach us, what they teach us about salvation, what they teach us about God, what they teach us about ourselves, what they teach us about the way we view others. Because y'all, it's powerful. The message found in this parable challenges the, the chosen, challenges the lost, and gives us an image of our great God. And so tonight we're going to look at the actions of the younger son. Now we know this younger son as the prodigal. Now, I've got to admit, I have used that term over and over and over and over again. But it wasn't until just recently that I actually went to the that I went to the dictionary to look it up. Because I thought maybe it had meant lost or um, you know, the unrepentant or something. But one, one portion of the definition of prodigal is wastefully arrogant. Wastefully arrogant. And if you read the first few verses of this parable that Jesus tells, oh boy, does, this, does that description fit this young man? But as we go on, we begin to see how, all, how this wastefully arrogant young boy or young man encounters, encounters the worst time of his life and that wastefully arrogant young man becomes a, a humiliated and humble young man. So let's look first at verses 11 through 13. In these verses we see Jesus telling the parable and he sets it, he sets it with three characters. We have the father, we have, and we have two sons, an older son and a younger son. The youngest son goes to his father and asks for his inheritance. He says, give me what is due to me. Whenever, whenever you're dead, whatever I'm going to get, go ahead and give it to me now. Now, I've got to tell you, this was a slap in the face of the father. And we're going to be coming back to this a little later. But I just want you to understand exactly what this young son was saying here. First off, he was telling his father, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead so I could go ahead and get what's coming to me. So I could go ahead and get my inheritance. So I can go ahead and get my hands on the earthly physical possessions. Because that's all he wanted. He wasn't cared about anything else. He wasn't cared about his father's love or compassion. He wasn't caring about his family. He wasn't caring about his other brother. He was only caring about himself at that moment. And caring about the immediate satisfaction that he could get if he just had, quote, what was coming to him. And so in going and telling his father that, he said, Father, I'd rather you be dead. Your life is keeping me from having what, what is owed me. And so that's part of it. But another part of it is he was telling his father that he believed he could do life better 
than his father. That You know the, the, the name of the old show, Father Knows Best? Well, he was kind of saying youngest son knows best. He was speaking out of arrogance. He was speaking out of youth. He was speaking out of inexperience. But instead of acknowledging that, he, in his pride, in his arrogance, in his wasteful arrogance, he said, I can do this without you. I can do this better than you. You see, this is the posture of us all prior to our relationship with God. From birth, we have a nature that is bent towards sin. We have a nature that that seeks to do the very same thing that Adam did and that Eve did, and that is to choose sin over God. And from the moment of our first sin, we love that sin. And we choose that sin over God over and over and over again. And when we make, whenever we sin, whenever we intentionally sin, we are declaring that we know better than God. We are declaring that what makes us feel good is better than what God says is good. You see, it's no secret that when we hurt others and when we damage our relationships with others or when we damage our relationships with our families or our friends or our spouses or or our God, that that's not good. It's not a secret to any of us that it's wrong when we sin. But what we're saying is we don't care. And we are in a front, we're in, we're in a front to God and telling him, we wish you weren't there because we, we think we could do better as God. And in verse 13, we see that this young son took his possessions to a faraway land and squandered them. Much like we end up doing in our sin. You see, he left all that was good in pursuit of something that he thought would be better. Once again, very similar to what we do. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, taking all that's good and in pursuit of something that we perceive to be better. Keep that in the back of your mind as we look at these next, at these, we look at these next three verses, verses 14 through 16. Just as he had gotten out, he began to party, he began to have a good time, he began to do what made him feel good, and he ran out. And not only did he run out, but the scripture tells us that a severe famine hit the land and he found himself in need. He ended up hiring himself out to be a servant. And the person that he hired himself out to obviously was a Gentile and had no respect for him as a Jew. Probably probably couldn't care less. And so he sends this once proud Jewish young man out into the field to tend the sheep. See, for a Jew, this was the bottom of the barrel. Pigs were considered unclean. To be dealing with pigs was to mean that you would never be able to approach the temple to worship God because you would always be ritually unclean. And he would have never had the time to become clean. Because to become ritually clean, you had to be apart from those things, go through a cleansing ritual, and then stay clean for a certain period of time. But if that was his job, there was no way. So he was constantly unclean. And so in the eyes of the Jewish law, he would have never been able to enter into that place where where he could properly worship God. And i got to tell you, this hanging out with pigs at least in this moment, is the perfect metaphor for sin. As long as we're hanging out around sin, we are always going to be dirty and defiled. And understand this, God is a holy God. He cannot stand sin. If you've heard me preach, you've heard me say that multiple times because it is the Bible truth that God is a holy God. He is perfect. He is just. There is no evil in Him. He's not the author of evil. He cannot stand evil. He is holy. He is God and He is separate from sin. And anything that is sinful, He cannot abide. He cannot be there. He cannot, he, he cannot handle the presence of sin. He, he refuses 
to be in the presence of sin. And so when we keep ourselves around sin and we find ourselves staying in amongst the pigs, we find ourselves staying in amongst the sins, we can't fully experience God. In fact, we can't experience God at all because God's not going to make His presence known to you if you have unconfessed sin in your life. If you are continuing, and I'm not talking about maybe a sin that you, that you might have done, that you think you might have done. I'm, not talk, I'm talking about willful sin where you know what you are doing is wrong and you're doing it anyways. That is going to separate you from God. It's going to destroy your relationship. That is exactly what, that's exactly what initially destroyed our relationship was sin. God cannot stand sin. And just as this, this man was perpetually dirty, according to the law, when we keep ourselves among sin, we are dirty. And we're willfully making ourselves that way. It's like giving a child a bath and then the first thing they do is go find the mud puddle and jump in it. I can't help but wonder what goes through God's mind whenever He does that. Whenever, he, whenever we do confess and we do repent and He does cleanse us of all unrighteousness and then we go back and we jump right back in the mud. See, that's what was going on. That, that was what was going on with this Jew. And his decisions up, up until that moment had led to that. And his decisions in that moment led him to that. In verse 16, we see that things got so bad for this young man that the hog slop began to look good to him. Forget the, fa forget the fact for a moment that these were richly unclean animals. He was in such desperate need that he was willing to eat the pig's food. See, this is where sin will inevitably lead us to the lowest point that we can go. Anything you want to pay. Look back at the text one more time. Verses 17 through 19. Here we see that he came to himself. This was an experience of humility. He looked around and saw his condition. He acknowledged that he had hit rock bottom. He acknowledged that he couldn't handle this on his own. The more he tried, the worse it got. And the scripture says he came to his senses. You see, when, when confronted with our sin, we have two choices to make. We can bear down and, and keep on keeping on within our sin. And in our pride, we think we can do it. Just give me one more day. One more day and I can, I can handle this. I can get through this thing that's holding me back. I'll just pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'll be just fine. The problem is that there will never be enough time for us, to, for us to overcome it ourselves and we will never have enough strength to overcome the sin problem in our life. The scripture is very clear in telling us we cannot earn our salvation. The Old Testament proves that we can't be good. So the second option is to respond like this young man. He went from being the arrogant and wasteful son to being the humbled son. He was, he realized what his situation was. He looked at his situation and saw it for what it was. He saw himself for who he was. He recognized the goodness that was present, not in himself, but the goodness that was present in the Father. And in humility, he decided to return to the Father. Over and over and over, the Scripture tells us that God honors the humble, that God, that God remembers the humble, that God saves the humble. And that's exactly what he's showing here. You see, this was a true sign of humility. He was going to be acknowledging to the Father what was wrong. 
and that he was wrong. Not the father, but that the son, that the son, he himself, was wrong. In his humility, he was going to have to submit to whatever judgment the father saw as just. Whatever judgment the father decided to dish out. In his humility, he was going to have to fall under that. And he was also going to be humbling, humbling himself to be submitting as a servant to his father. No longer as a son, and no longer with all the benefits of the son, but as a servant. Let's return to this text one more time. Verses 20 through 24. I know we read through 32, but I want to save those for a little later. I want us to finish up with verses 20 through 24. Here we see what happens to the humbled son when he returns home. The father runs out and embraces this young man. And at this moment, the young man has prepared this speech, saying, Father, I'm no longer worthy to to be your son Just let me be one of your servants. And and I can just imagine the father's like, son, I didn't hear a word that you say. Son, I love you. The father accepts him just as he is and restores him to perfect fellowship. See, this is the reception that we all receive when we come to the father. Scripture tells us that it is God's desire for all to repent and believe. God gives us all a sincere call to repent. God has given us the ability to make this decision. Our ability to choose is part of God's gift, is part of God's plan. Is God knew exactly what He was doing. He wanted us to choose to have a relationship with Him. God wants us to make a decision for ourselves. And when we come to Him, He welcomes us home and restores us to the relationship that we were created to live in. Understand this. You were created to live in a relationship with God. And if you are not doing that, you are not, you're, you're not going to feel fulfilled. You, there's going to be something missing, and that something missing is God. You were created for a relationship with God and the way you get that relationship with God is to repent of your sins and to put your faith in Almighty God. And understand this, when we come to Him, when we turn to Him in repentance, when we put our faith in Him, He welcomes us home and restores us to the relationship that we were created to live in. See, this is one of those messages of riches to rags to riches. The story of riches to rags is the story of us all. Every last one of us has the riches to rags story where we stumbled to sin, where we messed up, Adam and Eve may have passed on a sin nature, but we follow in their footsteps by also sinning, simply sinning. And so we all have that where we were created for a perfect relationship with God, but we chose to sin. Unfortunately, not all of us have the rebound story. Not all of us have the spiritual rags, the spiritual riches story. But it's not God's fault. Scripture tells us in John 3.16 that God loved everyone so much that He sent His Son to the world to die on an old rugged cross so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. The way we go from the spiritual rags to the spiritual riches, from death to life, from spiritual orphans to sons and daughters adopted by God is to simply repent and believe. Y'all, there's so much here. We either are currently now that prodigal, somewhere in the storyline, Either we're reveling in our sin right now, thinking it'll never come to an end, or we find ourselves in the pigsty, or we find ourselves walking up the path, preparing to encounter the Father. 
Or maybe you look back on it and you see that you were the prodigal at that one time. If you're that one that's, that, that knows, that you can see right now that you're the prodigal, well then turn. Repent. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you can look right now and you know, you know beyond the shadow of the doubt, you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you repented and believed you're one of His, well then celebrate. Praise God because He is worthy of all praise. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we thank You that You have been here with us. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for what it teaches us. We thank You for the power found in Your Word. God, I pray that, that Your Word would be what we submit to. God, knowing that Your Word is a revelation of You, telling us about Your grace, Your mercy, Your love, Your power, but also Your justice, Your judgment, Your wrath, and what, you yes, You even hate. So God, help us to submit ourselves to you through your word. I pray, God, that you'll help us this week to lead lives that are worthy of the title Christian. God, help us to, in every part of our lives, put a smile upon your face. Now, God, we love you and we praise you. We ask this in all prayers, in the precious and only name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And amen. So, as I mentioned earlier, be looking for some messages on Facebook, on the church Facebook page, as well as uh, be looking out for a phone tree that'll that'll be giving you any updates on exactly what we'll be doing uh, for our future services. I hope you have a wonderful week, and God bless and grace and peace to you.